then we get started. <laughs> Wonderful. Good afternoon, um, ladies and gentlemen, here um, and in front of the screens um, to our event, Europe's Global Role in Light of Russia's War in Ukraine, the Public um, Perspective. My name is Jana Polirin. Um, I was partly responsible for the poll, for the questions, but also for the policy brief that we had written together um, with my colleague Pavel Zerka on the basis of the results. Um, and I'm your host and moderator today. Um, I thought it would be delightful to invite people I admire for their wisdom and insights <laughs> and to um, let them comment uh, on our data, but also on what we um, made of the findings. Um, and that's what we'll do. But um, before we dive deep into the conversation, um, and before I introduce uh, my guests, just uh, a little background why um, we do polling in the first place at ECFR. So ECFR does polling um, since 2019 um, in the run-up to the EP elections. And it was, or one of the reasons was, basically the year 2016 with the events of Trump and Brexit where two things happened that the expert community had not really foreseen. And were, there was a very present feeling that experts were out of touch with uh, the broader public and that we lost yeah, kind of a, a sense of what the public was thinking and what people were really interested in um, and, and, and wanted to see. So, the idea is basically to prevent us, the bubble, from, from feeling too uncomfortable and from getting completely lost. So we want to touch base um, with the public sentiment um, and get a better understanding. But in this specific poll, the um, main idea was also that foreign policy is often seen as something for elites, um, yeah, for decision makers, but not something that affects the lives of ordinary people. And I think that is plain wrong. Um, and I think we will see many occasions where um, countries, politicians, decision makers need to make uh, important and difficult decisions. Like, for example, when it comes to uh, a great power competition uh, clash between um, the United States and China, how should Europe react when it comes to the whole relationship with Russia, when it comes to our future relationship uh, with the United States. And it can have, or it will have, implications for each and everybody um, when it comes to supply chains, living costs, energy, all of this. And we thought um, it's very important in a democracy um, that people basically think that what um, politicians decide, also in foreign policy, uh, is legitimate or has their backing and mandate. Um, and that's why we wanted to do this poll, because we thought it's a lot of, um, a lot of things have happened when it comes to yeah, Europe uh, in the world and global developments. So this poll is actually a part of a broader br uh, project we do on Europe's uh, global role with uh, Stiftung Mercator. Um, and the poll is one of the pillars. Um, so when we did it for the first time, not uh, a general uh, polling at ECFR, but a specific poll on uh, Europeans and their perception of other powers and the world two years ago, our overall sentiment was that um, Europeans still very much wanted to cultivate a strategic partnership approach. Basically, Europeans only knew strategic partners and no strategic adversaries. Um, and so two years later, a pandemic uh, later, um, and a major war, um, we wanted to check and what's left of that sentiment, that cooperative sentiment. So we um, did another survey, and we asked um, basically um, the same countries. We um, always poll in a selection of countries, not in all the European countries. That is very important when uh, we discuss our polling. This time we polled it in, uh, uh, polled in 11 European countries. Um, we did it via an online survey with um, agencies. Uh, we asked over 16,000 people, uh, which are representative of 78% of the um, European public. Um, what is important is that the selection of countries um, this time was basically the same that we uh, used two years ago, but we always try to br 
yeah, to find a good balance between north, south, east, west, the center, and that we include um, the biggest countries in Europe, um, but also some smaller ones. So a long intro, um, and we dive into the findings uh, now shortly. Um, and but first, I want to introduce my panel, um, and then um, I show you some data, and then we go into the discussion. So, um, ladies first, <laughs> um, I want to um, present um, Anna Sauerbrei, who is a foreign editor with the German uh, weekly Die Zeit, um, one of the most renowned uh, and well-established newspapers, I think, uh, in Germany. She has been previously with Der Tagesspiegel and is one of the leading uh, journalists on uh, foreign policy in Germany. Um, I'm also delighted to um, introduce uh, Stephen Erlanger, who is the chief uh, correspondent for Europe uh, for the chief New Year. Chief diplomatic correspondent for Europe. Chief diplomatic correspondent for Europe. Um, <laughs> and he is... <laughs> it's a mouthful. And he is working for the New York Times uh, from Brussels um, and is watching Europe, uh, but also has a particular interest in Germany, I, I sense, um, for, for quite some time um, now. And uh, Manuel lafon rapnuy is head of French uh, policy planning, um, which goes as CAPS, <laughs> and is um, yeah, a public official, um, a kind of not a journalist, but someone who actually... <laughs> <laughs> works in the diplomatic service and strategizes about uh, European and French foreign policy. So we have a... <laughs> and read journalists. Ah, and you read journalists, yeah, and uh, get influenced by uh, their, their opinions. So uh, we have a German, an American and a French perspective um, on the panel, and we want to discuss um, what role Europeans expect the EU or basically the European... Uh, yeah, a community uh, to play in the emerging global order and how they want to uh, conduct their relationships with the big powers. And just um, for you to not fall asleep, um, I um, suggest that we look um, at uh, a couple of data points, some of them um, we haven't introduced previously, and maybe we can um, put on the slides. Um, and that will be quick, but just to give you an impression um, of our <coughs> findings. I hope you can all... Um, see them. We had asked two years ago um, how, the, how Europeans basically perceive the, their relationship with the United States, China, Russia. Can we, can we stick with the first slide, please, and not go through it that quickly? Yeah. So, um, United States, China, Russia, and Turkey, um, we asked two years ago um, exactly the same, um, about the same countries, so that we are now able to track developments. And people were basically asked, um, how do you perceive um, each and every country as an adversary um, who we are in conflict with, uh, a rival um, with whom we need to compete, uh, a necessary partner with whom we must strategically cooperate, or an ally that shares interests and values. And you see certain developments. When it comes to the United States, um, at the very left, you see that the perception of the United States has... Um, yeah, <sighs> It has been changed um, in a positive way. Um, I mean, it's not a kind of a landslide, uh, but you see that whereas um, two years ago, none of the Euro in none of the European countries um, where we did the polling, uh, a majority uh, or a plurality of the people said the US is an ally. Uh, now that was the case in several um, European countries and the perception of the United States being an ally with um, whom we share um, interests but also values um, is, is now stronger again. Um, and also, kind of the overall, the blue is always positive. So the blue is, these are our friends. So you clearly see um, United States, um, very positive perception, either as an ally or as a necessary partner. When it comes to China, um, I personally was very surprised to see how little the data had changed compared to two years ago. What you see is uh, a slight increase when it comes to uh, rivalry, but an even bigger increase when it comes to partnership. And by and large, the predominant um, yeah, perception two years ago was that China was indeed a necessary partner. And that is the case also today, um, even more firmly so. 
when we turn to Russia, um, there I would say uh, a landslide or significant shift um, has happened. Uh, I mean, it took a war, but when you look at the red, the dark red, that is the adversary um, part, then you see that Russia now is clearly perceived as an adversary by more than half of the Europeans um, or um, as a rival, um, and that only very few perceive Russia as an ally, but still there are some. Um, and when it comes to Turkey, um, and we haven't discussed this uh, in our um, policy brief, and uh, I, we, I think we haven't presented the data, but we do now, um, what I find super interesting is that two years ago, Turkey was by many also perceived as an adversary and not so much uh, as a strategic or necessary partner, and that has basically improved. So Turkey um, is now much more seen um, as a partner than two years ago, and the negative uh, perceptions have decreased um, significantly. So this is the overall picture. Next slide, please. This was, I think, um, the most interesting finding, um, everything related to China was what I found particularly interesting. Um, here you see um, two data points, um, one uh, on the left-hand side um, is basically a scenario where we asked um, people, imagine China were to invite Taiwan and the United States would basically side with Taiwan or come to, to Taiwan's support and enter the conflict militarily. What would you, um, your country, what, what, you, what would you want your country to do? And yeah, people had several options to remain neutral, to side or to support the United States uh, or to support China or, or to say, well, I don't know. Um, and you see that the clear majority of people, 62%, said that they wanted to remain uh, neutral in such a scenario, whereas 23% of the Europeans said they wanted to support the United States. So support for China was not very prominent, but you see a clear unwillingness, basically, to side with the United States in the Indo-Pacific after all these talks we had for the past two years about a more joined-up transatlantic approach towards China, uh, after the United States has invested significantly in European security and one could have assumed that kind of people thought we need to return the favor, but that's obviously not the case, which I find uh, very interesting. And um, the other data point is also interesting because um, it says that although people perceive China as a necessary partner and want to remain neutral uh, in a conflict, they still um, have a red line or they still um, think that, um, yeah, China, if China were to supply weapons to Russia to help Russia with the war, um, that would be a reason for 41% uh, of Europeans to then impose sanctions whereas 33% of Europeans would rather not do that. Um, and we asked that as a trade-off question. So we asked people, do you want to impose sanctions on China, even if it would significantly harm Western economies, because that is what it would do? Or uh, would you prefer not to impose economic sanctions in order to save, uh, basically, Western economies? Uh, to, which, is, uh, which you can question, I mean, you, you can criticize the question, um, because uh, I don't know if it's likely not to impose sanctions um, and uh, not to um, harm our economies by doing this, but we can discuss this later. But the, the finding is nevertheless pretty clear. 41% are of the opinion that one uh, would need to sanction China. Next slide. This, uh, I go through that very quickly. Um, we asked this question not only two years ago, but already for the first time in November 2020, right after um, Joe Biden was elected, but still um, under basically the Trump uh, years impression. 
Um, and the question is very easy. Um, it's um, whether basically Europeans are convinced that the United States will always remain in Europe committed to European security um, and uh, Europeans don't need to do much or care much uh, about their uh, defense capabilities or whether Europe cannot always rely on the United States and need to look after its own defense capabilities. Um, and here you see that now, even more so than uh, in November 2020, under the impression of Donald Trump, now 74% of Europeans say, well, maybe we cannot always rely on the United States and we need to get serious ourselves and we need to be able to defend ourselves with our own defense capabilities. We didn't ask about the EU uh, doing this as an, uh, or the EU being the actor here. It was really just about the Europeans being at least theoretically capable of uh, doing this. But despite the strong transatlantic partnership, um, the number um, went up. Next slide. This is... Um, a question um, that deals with uh, our future relationship with Russia. You've seen in the polling that Russia is clearly perceived as an adversary, um, but we asked um, about a future relationship after what we called um, a kind of um, um, a peace settlement. No, or, or in, not a peace settlement, I need to be precise here, a negotiated settlement was agreed, which is important because we did not talk about peace. It's just a negotiated settlement um, between Russia and Ukraine, um, after kind of that in the, in the future, could somehow be reached. Um, what kind of relationship do Europeans want to have um, with Russia again? And here you see that basically every third poll um, says never ever uh, again any kind of relationship. My country should end all ties, whereas um, one third of um, yeah, people, um, for example, in Hungary, but also in Austria, are, are open to the idea of um, going all in again and have a fully cooperative uh, relationship. So going back to the status quo ante. And I think uh, even in Germany, um, the number is quite significant, uh, at least uh, if, if it were uh, to me. But you also see that uh, there is a consensus basically in Europe uh, to have a somewhat limited but still a relationship with Russia. So there is no majority for cutting um, all ties. Next slide, and I think that's the last one, just that you don't lose patience. This is a question that we haven't published yet, which I also find very interesting because we asked people who basically is the West. And the idea behind this was that there was so much talking going on uh, about the extended West, you know, um, other partners we needed to work with, other democracies. And we were wondering what do people perceive as being the West? And we gave them a number of countries and they basically could tick, um, or they needed to tick uh, the boxes of those countries that they perceived as being part of the West. Most um, people, or, or, or the country that basically came out strongest as part of the West is Australia. Uh, number two is Ukraine, and number three is Japan. Um, those three um, yeah, are the front runners and are somewhat part of the West, although one could argue that um, the numbers itself are not particularly strong. But then if you have, for example, a country like Turkey, which is a NATO member, is, not see, is with only 30% uh, percent of people basically saying, yes, Turkey belongs to the West, is uh, not a very strong uh, component of the West, I would say. Um, what I think is striking is, in a way, personally, but we can discuss this later, that Ukraine comes uh, only second, together with Japan and after Australia. I mean, we talk about a country um, that is supposed to be an EU member um, someday soon and might even be an, a NATO member. And I would uh, say that is more West than, uh, or, or that is kind of the, the most West uh, it gets. So whether that is positive or negative, maybe we leave uh, for the discussion, uh, which I would now, <laughs> after this very long introduction, and thank you for not losing um, patience, I'd like to start now. And maybe just going right into it by just asking uh, about your, o your overall impression impression of, um, of our polling and just the results. What do you think um, yeah, surprised you and how is your overall perception of kind of where the European <coughs> public is? Maybe I start with you, Stephen. Um, well, Jana, first of all, thank you. Thank you for asking me. Thank you for coming. Thank you for listening. 
everyone. Um, I think it's a very important poll. It's, it's, you know, I tried to push to find out what the margin of error is. It's pretty low. It's like plus or minus 3% for, for the most part, which is, I'm really quite good. Um, in an overall way, I find European public confused. <laughs> <laughs> it's a little bit contradictory in its views. Um, um, and we can get more specific about it. Um, I think in some ways it's also very reasonable. I mean, this whole idea that China is a necessary partner makes perfect sense to me from the European point of view. Uh, the fact that many Europeans see down the road some sort of limited relationship with Russia also seems to me perfectly reasonable and sensible because it's there, it's not going away, it's not going to collapse, I don't think. Um, it's not going to, you know, it's, it's <coughs> going to be part of everyone's lives for as long as we have them, I think. Um, but um, I find on China, well, I mean, what you see is the impact of the news, you know, which is Ukraine, um, particularly on Russia. The puzzling thing to me is always, and this may be the impact of Trump still, and it may also be the force of your boss, Mr. Macron, <laughs> but um, the idea that somehow the, the United States is this unreliable partner despite spending $40 billion <laughs> to defend Ukraine and the nuclear umbrella over all of Europe and having more American troops, 100,000 American troops now because of this war in, back in Europe and supplying Ukraine, not alone, but with, let's say, the largest part of its military. Um, and yet there still is this skepticism and um, there's a great desire, there's always a desire to do more for oneself and one never likes people on whom one is dependent. I think that's true. There's a kind of resentment that happens, a sort of ressentiment. But if you press people, which obviously the poll wasn't trying to do, about what that means to take more responsibility for European defense, how much would it cost? What would it mean buying? Would it mean spending 4% of gross domestic product every year on defense, as I suspect it would in a country that's still squabbling about reaching 2%, um, where in the 31 members now of NATO, only eight are, have reached 2% of GDP even though we're within a year of um, the goal when everyone was supposed to was was supposed to reach that, it just I, I think it's just part of the confusion about what it is to defend oneself. Um, but I'll stop there. There's lots to talk about. Anna, maybe um, your first. Well, well, two things that really surprised me, um, and the one thing was the great range of opinions on how a future relationship with Russia, Russia should look like or should not look like among European countries, and it really set me out wondering how the EU can ever find a common position with the results varying so much between uh, Bulgaria and Sweden, but even among the larger, more influential countries like Germany, France and Italy, for example, you've mentioned Italy. Um, so that was one important takeaway. We can maybe talk about it later, how that affects policymaking in the future. And the other surprise, and um, that's why I think it's, it's really important that you do those polls and you spoke about maybe the media and policymakers being out of touch with the the, the opinions in, in the larger publics was um, China, because my impression was that, in, I can only speak for Germany, mostly in my country, um, that in the policy sphere and the media sphere, the view of China has really pivoted in the last, say, five or six years, uh, coming from the Merkel years, with China being mostly viewed mm -hmm. as a partner, the very frequent visits of the 
Merkel and her government to China um, with large business delegations. Um, and I think it has become much more critical. There's much more work in many of the German ministries on trying to figure out where are the dependencies, what are the risks, how can we work against that. Um, and that doesn't seem to be quite reflected in, in the data. So people still view China um, not as the threat that many policymakers view it as these days. So that was an important finding, I thought. Although what, what I found interesting about the German data is that we Germans seem to belong uh, to the more uh, skeptical Europeans when mm. it comes to China. And that was even true to, to France. So um, kind of a country was, I mean, we can discuss this later, but a country was president um, has recently traveled to Beijing. And um, yeah, this trip could... Um, have been seen by some as a big uh, term offensive towards uh, President Xi. So, but even, I mean, in, in, in France and in, in Germany and in the Nordic countries, people seem to be much more skeptical uh, on China than uh, in, yeah, southeast of, um, of Europe, um, Italy, Austria, Hungary. Um. But maybe Manuel, talking about uh, your president already. <laughs> And the China trip. So, what is your first, um, yeah, impression? So, thank you, Jana, and and thank you for the for the polling and the analysis in the policy brief, which I recommend everyone to uh, to look into. It's really interesting. Uh, you you frame it in the policy brief as an opportunity to build public consensus on these issues, which I think is important. But um, there is a reason why more and more think tanks do polls and why uh, you guys at ECFR do them more and more often on a variety of issues, starting with the European Parliament election, which probably is very uh, uh, appropriate to do polls to much more uh, traditional hard policy uh, issues, which was not the case before. And one of the reasons why this is uh, happening is because it is more and more important for policymaking to understand what motivates the public. And you were mentioning Brexit and Trump, but actually ECFR in 2016, uh, uh, less than a week after the Brexit referendum, had published a, uh, a policy paper on uh, uh, insurgent European insurgent parties' uh, worldview and foreign policy, which was prompted at the time by a number of issues, uh, including this referendum you may remember in the Netherlands, where uh, there was a majority against the association agreement with Ukraine. Uh, and it was big deal for the government and big deal to find a way to get uh, to overcome that, even though the, the referendum was not uh, binding. Um, and the idea of this paper was already that what we were not calling populism was changing the way you were looking at foreign policy and that there is more and more pu public opinion interest for foreign policy issues. Probably not the way uh, experts or diplomats uh, or journalists <laughs> would like it to be, but in a way where basically uh, uh, migration, climate, trade, uh, uh, terrorism, uh, overseas interventions are things that people relate much more uh, uh, actively and intensely than they do before. And all of a sudden you have those parties who transform those foreign policy issues into domestic political issues. And so it's more and more important to get a sense uh, of that. So I read the poll, I read the paper. I'm surprised by a few points, not by the China point. I'm happy to get back to that uh, probably later. Uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm not so sure that I see a confused public. Uh, uh, I think that I see a public which is aware that the world, uh, the world is in disorder. So when you come and polls, you shouldn't fight the questions too much, so I'm not <laughs> going to fight the questions. <laughs> but obviously the questions have this kind of either or approach, and it's very difficult to be either or in the current world much more than it was the case before. And I, th I think the intro of your paper, Jana, with Pavel, is that uh, uh, Europeans uh, who uh, have whose worldview was based on cooperation as being good for peace and good for prosperity are adapting to a world of, no of non-cooperation. And I think that probably they are aware both of the fact that you need to adapt to a world of non-cooperation, but on the one hand, they would rather uh, uh, still have some cooperation because there's a need for that. Climate is one obvious case in point, but there are many others. And on the other hand, they are wary that this competition turns into a confrontation and they 
they're reluctant to favor confrontation as the only option to deal with this competition. Yeah, which might not be unwise, actually, <laughs> this, um, this general thinking. <laughs> Um, maybe if, if it's okay with you, I would like to dive deeper into um, some of the issues um, and maybe starting with China because it's such a big question now for so many um, Europeans. So we've seen um, a strong, um, yeah, kind of intent of the Europeans to consider China still a necessary partner, although in some countries, um, when you look um, at our polling data more concretely or look in the policy brief, you'll see that in some countries um, the predominant perception is rival or adversary. But um, overall in Europe, it's the necessary partner. At the same time, which I found interesting, we had a question on the relationship between China and Russia. And kind of the overwhelming majority of the people we asked saw a close connection, a, a partnership, a, as the, the partners themselves say, a no-limits partnership um, between them. Why do you still think there is so little Zeitenwende, if you want to use this German term, on China? Um, but on Russia, we, we saw basically uh, the landslide. Okay, one country is waging war, the other isn't, which makes a big difference, but still. Um, so why do you think um, China has still this kind of positive reputation? I mean, you, you, um, you said you can understand this. Well, one reason is this building we're in, which is... But, but maybe you have to be transparent. We are here in a studio, uh, of, in of a, a Volks, which is called Volkswagen Drive. <laughs> right. And, and, and Volkswagen is a company that is, at the moment, deeply dependent on China, both in terms of its car sales and its batteries. So there's a rational reason to want to have a good relationship with China, and, you know, sometimes in my country, people talk about, you know, the Europeans are soft on China because they're trading with China, which to me is absurd. The United States trades hugely with China. I mean, it's an absurd thing. I mean, it's, it's you know, we can talk about my country also and its polarization, which is quite scary. But, you know, China has become this litmus test. And when I talk to American congressmen and senators, not just think tankers and so on, um, they are looking to Europe to make decisions on China. And I think it's a little, un you know, to me, my personal view is it's a little unfair right now because I find in this country and in France and other countries, there is a recognition of the problem of dependencies, which started with COVID and all the medical supplies and so on and so on, um, you know, rare earths, all these things we depend on China for. And the idea of globalization has taken a knock. I mean, it doesn't disappear, but suddenly the new word is, there are two new words, not so new. One is resilience, which is a big favorite word. Uh, the other one is de-risking, right? So, so somehow, the problem is between America and Europe, when we talk about China, our resilience is your protectionism and vice versa, right? So there, there really are issues there. Um, and it makes perfect sense that people, you know, look at China as a big, growing, rising thing that's far away. Um, on Taiwan, I mean, we probably should talk about that separately, but um, the failure, at least, you know, 62% want to be neutral. Mm -hmm. Now, it's not very clear what European support for the United States on Taiwan would mean, frankly. Yeah, that's He's a asking criticism. Europeans to go to war, yeah. but, you know, Europe depends on the same trade routes. Taiwan's a democracy. There are value issues. There are trade issues that make Taiwan not an indifferent question for a Europe that believes in democracy and free trade, again, in my opinion. But this is not so clear from the polling. I don't know if you, by any chance, know similar polls in the United States or if we just um, ask your gut feeling, but 
Do you think if we had asked Americans about their perception of China, would it have been more negative? Yeah. So it's more clear-cut in the United States? Yeah, it's become a big political issue. I mean, it just is, you know, it's, it's one of the... There are basically two, two big bilateral... Well, there are others, but the two big foreign policy bilateral issues where you get bipartisan support. One is NATO. Republicans and Democrats support NATO. And two, they think China's a peer rival and we need to do something about it. So, Anna, on Stephen's last point, <coughs> do you think that the positive perception of China is also due to the fact that some Europeans might perceive kind of the sentiment in the United States as something that they don't want to basically side with? I mean, Emmanuel Macron, coming back to the elephant in the room again uh, during that um, famous trip, has basically in that famous interview he has given on his way back said that Europeans should be kind of cautious not to get dragged into conflicts or crises, I think he said, mm. that are not ours, not European. Do you think that the Europeans just refuse to see China through the American lens and that the European lens is just much more positive? Uh, is that, is that, does that play a role in your perception, uh, in your opinion? Then again, I can only give you a gut feeling because I, I yeah. don't have any polling <laughs> on that. But um, I don't think, um, f at least in Germany, people see it much through the American or even anti-American mm -hmm. lens. But um, I think it's rather a feeling that, as uh, as you've said, it's 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 far away, um, and China hasn't, other than Russia, really done anything very visible, very tangible uh, to Germany. They're, they haven't even sent a spying balloon to float over <laughs> our territory and collect data, like in the United States, which, which I think to Americans was a very tangible experience of what, uh, what, the, uh, what the conflict looks like and that it can come to your territory. And um, in Germany, I think um, many people just can't grasp um, the so-called China threat. I mean, of course, we've seen through the pandemics that, that certain goods were lacking and that some of the goods were even lacking on purpose or given to other countries like Italy, instrumentalized in building relationships. Um, I think that's forgotten now. Um, I think most people don't have a sense what a conflict with Taiwan really would mean to their ability to buy an iPhone or a washing machine um, or to our military capabilities or the military capabilities of our allies, I think that's something that still has to sink in. And with Russia, the threat is so obvious. It's just a brutal imperialist country living out its imperialism on a neighboring country that's only like 4,000 kilometers away where people have maybe traveled before. And that's not the case with China. It's sort of an invisible imperialism, I would say, to most Europeans, um, or at least central the, the Europeans in, in Central Europe, of course, some countries um, like Lithuania, like Italy, have had a much more tangible experience feeling those trade relationships or the instrumentalization of trade, but not here. So, Manuel, in our policy brief, we basically came to the conclusion that Emmanuel Macron got a lot of criticism from people like, for example, me. I was very critical. I wrote a critical commentary. Other think tankers did too. I think... Um, other heads of state and government, um, remember the Polish president in the United States, were quite outspoken. So a lot of criticism for the trip, or not the trip per se, but kind of the interview uh, first and foremost, or maybe also the promo video on Twitter uh, about the great partnership. And But our finding, I mean, was clearly that European people, the public, um, seem to be more in Team Macron when it comes to neutrality, uh, in the case of Taiwan, like not uh, getting dragged in a conflict that is not theirs, the general perception of China as a, as a partner more than as an adversary or a rival. Then another data point that we had when we asked um, people about how risky they think the relationship with China is when it comes to trade and investment, because that is, I mean, we are not talking, when we talk <coughs> about the China risk, we are basically talking also uh, about an economic risk, about China using economic coercion to blackmail us, uh, about our uh, over-dependence on China. It's, I think we, we are not really talking about a military threat or something, which is an abstract threat but which seem to be clearly too abstract for many people. Um, in our polling, more people thought 
kind of risks and benefits are equally balanced or um, the, 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 the relationship is uh, more beneficial than risky. So was Macron right? So three things. Yes, of course. <laughs> <laughs> three things. Um, I'm not sure I would uh, oppose Tim Macron and Tim van der Leyen as you do in the policy brief. Um, I think the no decoupling but de-risking is basically what France has been promoting for several years now. If you think in terms of uh, uh, investment screening, trade defense instruments, anti-coercion, anti you just mentioned it, uh, export control, these are things that France has been pushing for, uh, not everybody agreeing at the beginning, and this was a huge priority for uh, the French presidency of the EU of last year, where there was a few other topics also on the agenda with the start of the war. Nonetheless, we pushed uh, for that quite uh, heavily. Um, and when Ursula von der Leyen says uh, that she's uh, for de-risking through diplomacy, I think it fits very well with the way we sit, and it probably is a difference with uh, what some others, uh, including in the US, not the administration, but uh, others in the US uh, have in mind. Um, and while I might it uh, uh, on Taiwan, um, actually when the president was on the trip, there was a frigate uh, coming into the Taiwan Strait, which was not a coincidence, uh, which was not a, a singular event, which is something we do regularly. The Chinese know it, the Chinese don't like it, they, they protest about it. Um, our relations with Taiwan uh, have been developed. I think when uh, Lithuania was put on the spot by China, France, like the other, other EU members, uh, displayed solidarity with Lithuania. And so th th this not our crisis is not Taiwan is none of our uh, business or interest. I think you have tons of not just statements, but facts that show that uh, uh, it is not how we see these things. But the idea, as I was pointing to, that the confrontation is inevitable is part of a, a problem for the EU. It is actually part of a problem for this US administration, which, as Steve was uh, uh, showing, uh, explaining, is under some pressure uh, to for being too conciliatory or not reacting uh, strongly enough to a balloon uh, issue, etc. Um, more specifically, Getting back to your poll, uh, actually, the majority of, of the answer of the question, I don't know if we can see it, is those who believe that it is both risks and benefits, yeah. which precisely means that there is uh, a support for no decoupling but de-risking. If, if it was more risk or only risks, then it would probably be, uh, you would probably be going for decoupling. If it was uh, benefits rather than anything else, you would be um, saying, let, let's not do anything. But if you have a plurality uh, that say that the trade and investment relation is basically risks and benefits, and if you add to that those who believe that uh, it is more risky than benefits, then you have a majority of people uh, for that uh, version. And so, yes, it's probably <laughs> a case in point for our policy, but for uh, what von der Leyen uh, framed in a, a speech by uh, this um, uh, formula. And on Taiwan, my, my uh, third point, um, it is striking that there is a majority in all countries for this neutrality position. Um, I think... Uh, again, I'm not going to blame the question, even though I think uh, saying support the US rather than support Taiwan changes <laughs> the, the, the way to look at it a bit. Not that the US is uh, someone you don't want to associate with, but that support the US probably means in people's mind uh, uh, Iraq. doing a military operation, yeah. a heavy military operation. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas even for Ukraine, We've all agreed that the idea that was that we wouldn't be co-belligerent, and yet there is huge uh, uh, support to Ukraine, etc. And so, if you go for sanctions, if if you give an option of what do you do? Do you do nothing, or do you do sanctions, etc.? I suspect you have a, a more mixed uh, uh, image. And on the other question, which is uh, separate because it's on Russia and Ukraine, but it probably, uh, you, you put it on the same slide for a good reason, I think, which is it says something about how the European public would react to Chinese behavior. Um, in the case of Taiwan, 
Taiwan would seriously harm Western economies, whether we take sanctions or not. Yeah, that, that, yeah. And so it would really change dramatically the kind of assessment of what you were saying, that does it seriously harm uh, our economy or not? And my last point on, on that uh, neutrality is, I think when people enter the question of if China invaded Taiwan and the US com came to its defense, would you support the US or remain neutral? Remain neutral is probably a good expression of the fact that people would rather have no conflicts. And when the conflicts happen, if it happens, usually in polls you have a big change in, in the opinion uh, position. And that was the case with Ukraine. Mm. The I level of support for Ukraine now is way higher than it was uh, two years ago with the same kind of questions. Mm. There's a reason for that. Yeah. I would maybe jump in because I, I, I agree and I don't agree. <laughs> I agree on, on your point that that might be a framing problem in a way because um, it leaves out, the, if you put um, it to those extreme cases, deliveries of weapons and a war in Taiwan, these are hopefully things that are far in the future. And I think the questions that European policymakers have to answer in the nearer future are much more in that gray zone. Mm -hmm. How much do we support American policy of retaining a large advantage in certain mm -hmm. military uh, technologies? Mm -hmm. um, do we uh, do it like the Dutch and uh, get our uh, one company that has a monopoly on certain mm -hmm. ship making technologies to um, not deliver those to China? I think those are the immediate questions questions we have to answer and they are not in that in, in that very extreme the, the extreme positions and I think there's a very large gray zone where Europe can uh, decide whether it stands or stands not with the United States without taking a fundamental position whether it still wants to be an ally or not and I think that was exactly the problem with the Macron interview that he framed it exactly that way and and it's a Chinese framing the Chinese say to the Europeans you're either vessels of the United States Mm -hmm. or you're independent, and I think that's not really the question, and I think that was the problem that he put it like that. So there's, there's a whole lot of comments and interviews and statements, including one he made two days later in the Netherlands, know, yeah. making it clear that uh, the, the message that got through with his interview is not reflective of the full comprehensive French policy mm. on these issues, <laughs> where uh, uh, Taiwan, there is an interest for us in keeping the status quo uh, with Taiwan, um, and there are actually, he went in, in China and delivered these messages to Xi Jinping. Yeah, yeah but in, in a certain way, we wanted to get at this with the question. We, we asked the question in April. Macron had just been um, mm. to Beijing. It was all over the news. It was something that people had in mind, I think. Um, so that was also a bit of a, a test for what, what, what Macron had said. But Stephen, I have a question. The hard part yeah. is to get, just to stop him from thinking aloud in front of journalists. Sorry? The problem is to stop him from th musing aloud in front of journalists. I'm but, in but charge of police You don't, do, you, you don't do your species a favor you know? here, Stephen. I mean, that's what you live from, right? We don't from want these to business model. <laughs> <laughs> but I have, uh, coming back to China and the de-risking um, approach, because I think there is actually a, a basis for de-risking. I don't think, oh, I personally would not say seeing the partnership as having uh, risk and benefits um, at equal level is uh, a mandate for de-risking. But when I look at our polling, um, we ask more specific questions about um, are Europeans basically willing to accept Chinese ownership of, and then we ask several things, a football club, a news company, company uh, a tech, uh, a, a news, uh, a, 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 a mm. newspaper, a tech company, um, or a critical. Well, I think we did not even put critical infrastructure, but just infrastructure. So bridges, um, no, no ports mm -hmm. um, on everybody's minds. Maybe telecommunication networks. Uh, I would consider critical infrastructure. And what we saw there was that Europeans were, became much more critical. Basically, not uh, when they were asked about it. Uh, trade and investment relationship and about, I don't know, uh, Volkswagen's activities in China, but more uh, about Chinese activities in Europe. And I think that could be a starting point if you wanted to explain why de-risking um, was actually a sensible thing to do um, to, to start at home. But Stephen, I wanted to ask you, 
now that de-risking seems to be something that um, Emmanuel Macron and Ursula von der Leyen equally embrace. Our yeah. chancellor in Germany, uh, Chancellor Scholz, has said, yeah, uh, he supports uh, von der Leyen. Do you think that the American vision of de-risking and the European vision of de-risking are, are, are the same or go yeah. together or kind of merge? Well, it's one of those words, right? I mean, how big is the garden, right? I mean, I think Jake Sullivan's line is, we want a small garden with great big walls. In other words, there's only parts of the economy that we want to protect, which have to do with technology and chips and, and dual use defense stuff and espionage. Uh, and then around that, we build a big wall and the rest is fine. Well, that's a metaphor. Metaphor isn't reality. So I don't really know the answer to your question. I think you know, even the opposition of decoupling and de-risking is ridiculous, right? Because nobody's talking about decoupling from China. Who would want to? Some I mean, American think tankers do. Yeah, well, <laughs> no, that's right. But we should do the same poll in America. I mean, maybe Pew has done it. I, I don't really know. Um, but I do think, and I mean this quite seriously, I've been watching this for for five, six years, and Europe has moved quite a long way, and, and I don't mean just Europe, call Europe, I mean, the, I mean Brussels also. I mean, the, the investment screening, it's still voluntary, but it's getting more important. Um, there has been a pushback from countries as back as 2018 about Chinese buying ports in 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 the Arctic, in Greenland. Um, there's a, there was a big debate here. I'm not sure it came out in the right way over Hamburg and, and how big a share China would buy of the port of Hamburg, which is certainly very important. Um, so there is, and then there's Huawei. People have moved to cut themselves off from Huawei infrastructure as much as possible. And having talked to even your BND, there are reasons for that. It's not just an anti-China thing. I mean, there's actual technical reasons why you might not want to depend on, on, on Huawei. There's issues about TikTok. I just think people gradually really are beginning to understand that there are risks and beginning to think of how you limit the risks or de-risk important parts of of the economy, the risk, which is very hard to de-risk, is that it goes overboard and really damages a very important trading relationship, um, which is important. I mean, I mean, when, when you think of the impact on China, too, I mean, part of the China's problem right now is its own export model is in trouble. Right? I mean, it's, it's having, it's, it has demographic problems, it has all kinds of problems. I mean, I sometimes think China is much more fragile than, than we think from, from the outside. It's got lots of internal pressures and problems, but its own economic model is at risk. Um, and, and also when you're looking from Beijing's point of view and you listen to President Biden say four times now the United States would come to the military aid of Taiwan, which is not necessarily <coughs> our policy, and then the White House pulls it back four times. If you're in Beijing, you listen to the president, you don't listen to the spinners. And so there, there's this kind of, at least some of the people I talk to in Europe, that there's this anxiety that this push will accelerate Xi Jinping's timetable. Yeah, yeah. Um, rather than slow it down. But again, speculative. But I'm, I'm going on too long, but I mean it positively. I think Europe gets it. I don't think there's that big uh, division between um, the risks China poses seen from America and from Europe on technologies. The difference is Asia Pacific, we're an Asia Pacific power. We have different relations with Taiwan. That puts us in a different place. Mm -hmm. Interestingly, in a certain way, our uh, survey mirrors exactly that. But let's um, maybe move on um, because I want to discuss some other things um, as well. The next um, thing I wanted to discuss with you is what to make of the 
huge amount of people who don't want to be dependent on the United States when it comes to um, their own defense. Uh, Manuel, uh, again to the French <laughs> channel, the kind of your, your inner kind of uh, Macron advocate. Um, Emmanuel Macron has uh, on mutual occasions uh, said that Europe needs to be more self-sustainable, more capable, uh, more independent also from the United States, talking about strategic autonomy. Do you feel vindicated by the public poll? Maybe we can just put it on just briefly just to, to show you the impressive numbers. Is that a mandate for you, for which, Macron? Which was impressive already in 2020. Yes. It was already more than a majority of people saying we can't always rely on the US and we need uh, our own defense uh, capabilities. Um, so I, I'm, I'm not surprised that the number uh, um, grow. Um, I think that um, it's it's not it's not. Stephen was saying uh, it's it's strange to believe that the U.S. is not reliable at a time when it's doing so much for European security, and I don't think people don't believe this U.S. administration is reliable, but actually <laughs> this U.S. administration is on the record saying we know that you in Europe might be wondering if U.S. commitment to European security might be sustained uh, uh, in the future given elections. Um, so if, if, this U if this U.S. administration says the question is a legitimate one and tries to address it, I'd be surprised that the, the European public doesn't uh, believe that maybe there's something uh, uh, to, to pay attention to. Um, and the second thing which is striking is actually if you want to favor a as strong and close as possible relationship with the US, then you have this US administration who also on the record say there is nothing to be feared uh, for the US from strategic autonomy except a fake autonomy because we need the Europeans to get the muscles uh, uh, that they claim through this uh, discourse of strategic autonomy. And so the framing is not, um, d d d you, you rightly started saying the, the framing of the, 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 the wording of the question is important. It's not we shouldn't be dependent on the US uh, uh, defense why, it's we need our own defense uh, capabilities. If you believe in, in burden sharing and responsibility sharing, and you think that's a good way to have a better, more sound, more uh, uh, effective and more sustainable relationship with the US, you can still end up thinking you need your own defense capabilities and you need to invest more. And that's the commitments uh, our governments made uh, uh, through NATO. And there's probably uh, a lot that the EU itself uh, can do also. So no, I'm, I'm really not surprised. And, and I don't think <laughs> many uh, EU governments are surprised. Uh, that there is a big discussion still on European sovereignty or strategic autonomy, is that the right wording? Should we look uh, for being independent or not? Et cetera. But if you look at what we are doing collectively, it more or less goes in a very similar direction, which is we need to be able to, de to do more on our own. At the same time, you see that the transatlantic relationship is alive and kicking. It's uh, in better shape than... Um, kind of, yeah, in November um, 2020. So is, do you think that policymakers could use this as um, a mandate or um, yeah, a task to basically strengthen the European pillar in NATO as a, as, a, as a result? I mean, not answering the poll, but just kind of, do you think they would, that would result, uh, have better results or resonate with more people than uh, us talking about strategic autonomy and about the Europeans needing to become more independent? Do you think that the public would be more receptive? Anna? I think it's hard to say for Germany whether that really transform into the, transforms mm -hmm. into the willingness of spending more because that's what it comes down to. Defense is very costly mm -hmm. and uh, I think we're just now, uh, it's too early to tell for Germany because we're only just now seeing or, try or starting to feel the trade-offs that have to be made. Um, the German finance minister now has to cut 20 billion from the budget or to, to keep uh, the debt limit um, and uh, he's now just discussing with his fellow cabinet members where to take the money from because one line Germany is following that it, the defense 
budget is not to be touched, so the 20 billion have to come from the other ministries, the other household uh, components. Uh, and I think this is the first time that also the German voters really see that, okay, um, this is really costly and we have to take it from, I don't know, me, from, from the Ministry for Families and from, from education uh, and from um, traffic. Um, so I guess that's uh, something that will be answered in the next German elections for, for this country, <coughs> but of course it's also true for other European countries. And then I also wonder whether um, to really have some I mean, no, I don't wonder, I know that to have some effect until the next American presidential election, which is uh, at the end of next year, is really too late. I mean, uh, if Donald Trump becomes the next American president, we will be pretty much on the same level of defense capabilities that we have now. There's no way <laughs> this can be changed this quickly. Uh, and of course, the outcome of that election might have another effect on, on the German debate and the European debate about that. Can I just add very quickly, um, I don't know what's going to happen in November 2024. It's a long way away. I don't know if Joe Biden is going to be alive, you know, <laughs> yeah, inshallah. Please. No, no, <laughs> yes. I mean, seriously, who knows? He's just had a two-day root canal. So what does that tell you? Nothing. Um, so I think we also, you know, Trump's under indictment now in two different cases and there are two more investigations coming and of course he can run under indictment but I think he's it's a complicated picture and it's got a long way to run and I I think people should should not get too upset yet um, I also wanted to remind people that actually I don't know if his people told Trump but under Trump we put more American troops back into Europe yeah the ones that Obama took out, yeah. and we put a tank brigade back into Europe, which Obama took out. I think the important point is whether he knew or whether well, he didn't. Well, but <laughs> it happened, <laughs> and he um, authorized the sale of weapons to Ukraine that That's Obama true. did not. So, you know, it's a complicated picture. That's all I would say. And I think, you know, Manuel, I mean, you're right. I mean, I'm actually a believer in strategic autonomy if it's done in an intelligent way. I think Europeans should do more for themselves. I think they should have their own defense industries because taxpayers have the right to spend money on jobs at home. I mean, all these things make perfect sense. And the way Macron frames it, and he's been framing it this way actually for quite a long time, it's as a you know, in combination with NATO as a European pillar, not as an autonomous European army, blah, 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 blah. I mean, I'm all for that. I think a lot of Americans are actually expressed that way, see the benefit. We've been asking Europe to spend more money on its own defense ever since Harry Truman. I mean, it's, it's, it's a regular plea. So it is also true once in a while when Europe acts like it's going to do more, we get ambivalent. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> I admit that. But I think, you know, given Asia, given the worries about China, uh, I think Washington would be really happy if Europe would step up more on Ukraine, would spend more on its military, would take EU accession seriously to the Western Balkans and, and Ukraine and have a serious debate about what it will cost you because it's going to cost you a lot and this is what as anna said worries me i mean you're still fighting here about two percent and will you get to two percent and two percent in germany is quite a lot i understand it's quite a lot of money but it is a floor now at nato but we committed to 2%. I yeah. think we will do so well, tomorrow when we publish yeah. the national security okay. strategy. Right. We are just not spending it. That is yes. uh, or long term. Not with <laughs> <us>. <laughs> <laughs> that, that is the problem. Yeah, um, no, no. But anyway. I, I, I want to, to get your... I mean, you two are journalists. You, your job is basically also to get foreign policy across to the people, mm. to make it transparent, to explain why it matters. And you, Manuel, you um, need to invent, inv get, invent intelligent foreign policy strategies um, that basically, yeah, of course, also shape uh, opinion and take it into account, but also uh, lead or, or try to, to guide, I think, public opinion. 
Um, one interesting result in our polling is that 60% of European citizens don't feel basically well represented when it comes to foreign policy or don't feel heard. Um, they, th they said that their voice is not taken enough into account when decision makers um, yeah, t make foreign policy decisions. Do you think this is just because European citizens always want to get uh, more of a say and be included in, and, and are not happy with their governments in general? Or is there really a problem when it comes to foreign policy being too detached from the elites? And if so, how can we, we, I mean, you and me, <laughs> but uh, how can experts, journalists, policymakers basically explain better to the public why it's relevant and give the public, first and foremost, uh, uh, the feeling that they are heard, that they can have a say, that they have an influence. Any ideas? <laughs> Volunteers? Ben plenty. <laughs> yeah, then shoot. So first, that's why it, it felt a bit strange that journalists would tell me that it would be better if the president doesn't speak so much to the press. More seriously, I was teasing I more seriously, <laughs> I, I think <laughs> there is a uh, need to talk more about these issues to the press and that the press talks more about it. And when I think of the press, it's all kind of press uh, uh, and social networks. Uh, in France, if you want to talk to the broader public, you go and talk to the regional press and the interviews are very different, but you've seen a lot of ministers of foreign affairs or European affairs in the regional press for the last six, seven years, and there's a reason why it is uh, the case. That's the first thing. Second thing is there is a big change in the way the French Ministry of Foreign Affairs communicates these days. If you go on social networks and precisely every social network, not just uh, Facebook uh, or uh, uh, Twitter, but everything, you see a lot of uh, uh, data visualization, you see a lot of short videos, you sh see a lot of different formats. There's, if, if you understand French, there's a very good podcast series on the Ukraine crisis, which is kind of more of a rad radio uh, show uh, uh, with details and everything. Th you try to not just uh, uh, do what diplomat classical diplomatic communication was, which is you talk and you expect people uh, to, to come and get what you said, get the message, because they are interested, because they are think tankers or journalists or fellow diplomats for, uh, from uh, other governments, but you try to make sure that the message gets across and gets across the target. And the target is directly the people. It's not just your usual uh, uh, traditional uh, bubble. And the third thing is, because it's not just about communication, and there is in the US this big discussion about what uh, a foreign policy for the middle class looks like, and that was a big idea of the national security advisor, who, the, the, the Jake Sullivan, who is now the national security advisor of President Biden, when before the election, he, he prompted this big report about foreign policy for the middle class, and the idea was, as I was saying, you can't have a foreign policy uh, that the public believes is for some kind of interest, but not their interest. And so you need to adapt so that you don't leave that uh, uh, void space where all of a sudden the only alternative is someone who does domestic politics rather than foreign policy in this international space which is what a lot of uh, populist governments uh, have done or would be doing uh, even when they are uh, in, in place. And that raises a lot of questions on our trade policy, on our economic policy in general, on how you make the case for solidarity uh, policy and development assistance, on why you need to spend your 2% on uh, defense and maybe more, which makes the case for why you should have some kind of industrial uh, uh, returns on that investment, because 2% on defense is an investment, not just in terms of jobs, but also in terms of research and innovation, for instance. So all, all of that is a different way to look at how you are doing foreign policy. And, and that's th it's happening in most of our countries, actually. Mm. Do you think, Stephen, that foreign policy for the middle class really resonates with the people? That kind of <laughs> the strategy has had any impact? Um, actually, I think it has, partly because, very unusually for a democratic administration, Biden has a national industrial policy. I mean, it's pretty protectionist in some ways. I mean, and it's aimed at creating jobs for Americans. 
I mean, that shouldn't seem unusual to most European countries, but for us, it's, you know, we, we have tended to be more free traders. That hasn't been true for a while now, but the Democratic Party, you know, has always shied away from this kind of thing, and <coughs> Biden's embraced it. So, and Biden thinks of himself, you, you know, everyone has own myths about themselves, but he thinks he's the candidate of the forgotten American middle class. And in part, his success against Trump is exactly that, because Trump has claimed to speak for that forgotten class. So, I mean, it's been a very deliberate strategy, I think, um, and, and so far, so good, we'll see. I mean, um, Biden's still very unpopular. The one thing I would say, which is a big problem we all have, is that elites are really unpopular and governments tend to be unpopular and leaders are unpopular. I mean, there aren't a lot of leaders with very high opinion ratings. So the skepticism among people, you know, among, I don't know what you call them, the people, the narod, the, I mean, the voters is high. It's just high everywhere. And partly it's because, to me, thinking of Europe in general, a lot of the promises of, you know, the EU, I mean, they've come true sort of, but the promise of considerably greater wealth and more productivity and so on, it's, it's not been so clear, frankly. I mean, European growth is still very slow compared to other places. Um, Self-confidence in Europe generally isn't tremendously high. Confidence in leaders isn't very high. And what is foreign policy but an elite project? So explaining it is crucial. You know, why it matters to you, why it matters to your family, why it matters to your ability to read what you want and listen to what you want. Let me stop you here and because yeah. um, I, go. I, no, I have a question okay. to, to Anna, which is related to this, um, but it's in also very much in a German context because maybe also in, in France and the United States, but in Germany kind of this um, format of Bürgerdialoge has become very popular. So Annalena Baerbock has toured um, through Germany ex trying to explain foreign policy, the M Munich Security Conference had, has this outreach program. I know that Die Zeit had several attempts to meet basically the reader and to uh, engage. Do you think all that is the right strategy or has any impact? I think it might have some impact. I, I think it does. I mean, of course, you reach a very limited uh, a very limited group of people when you meet people in person. Mm -hmm. When she goes somewhere, Annalena Boeber goes somewhere, or Steinmeier goes to one of the Eastern Federal States and talks about Russia um, politics, um, he will meet a limited group of people and then there's maybe some amplification by the, by the local and regional media, which is very important, I think. Um, I think what they mostly discuss is um, the issues. So what should the next national security strategy be about and how should it mention Russia? How should it mention China? Um, and I think that's a very difficult question for most people to answer. Um, I think what could help more is to, and, and that's a self-criticism too, is to explain more what the process is behind finding solutions and agreements on the international level looks like. Because I think already the Bundestag, to many people in Germany, is still a black box. How do they really negotiate a law and how does it come into effect and who's having a say on that? And I think the whole international sphere is even more removed. Uh, you see those images from summits with a, a bunch of leaders, mostly males, standing against some uh, very picturesque background. <laughs> um, but, but you don't know what they were really saying to each other when they were in the room. So I think that's something that maybe we, the media, could do more is like dive deeper into the diplomatic process and explain how the Sherpas meet beforehand. Um, of course, we need the information from the Sherpas to do that, but des describe how they get to a certain decision and then, of course, what, what effect it might have. Mm -hmm. And otherwise, you just leave a space for including manipulation of information and influence operations. But 
but not just for that, also for imagination and, and worries and concerns. And I, to, to remain on, on Germany, uh, when there was this negotiation of the uh, Aachen Treaty, mm -hmm. uh, uh, it gave way to a number of silly analysis in France of we're going to uh, enforce German law on French soil, we're going to give away uh, the French permanent seats uh, to the UN Security Council, to Germany, uh, which had nothing to do with the treaty, and which the usual way of negotiating the treaty, which is you negotiate, you don't talk about what you negotiate uh, so much, you don't give the various drafts, and you publish it on a certain day when the text is ready and formalized, because if there's a nuance of a correction, then there is over interpretation and it might create a problem. So you want to do that and everything is agreed only, uh, uh, nothing is agreed until everything is agreed. So you need to wait for everything to be solved. And, and there was a huge space for all these interpretations, etc., which even the publication of the treaty was not enough to then deal with it because mm. it, it went on for several weeks yeah. and you still find traces of it. No, but I think that's a very important point that we don't have enough on our radar, kind of also the disinformation <coughs> that uh, kind of in foreign policy or kind of the role disinformation plays in, in foreign policy. Um, we have 15 minutes left. If anybody here in the room wants to ask a question, just, um, I mean, you, you are very welcome to do. You don't need to. I have still plenty uh, more. I just thought while you're sitting there and maybe get bored, <laughs> maybe you want to ask yeah, one. Yeah, there is a lady over there. Um, but don't feel obliged. But just if you, if I don't want to put you on the spot, but since we have a, a small audience. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, my name is uh, Barbara Mittelhammer and I'm a, um, an independent political analyst uh, working on foreign policy. So um, actually I would have a question referring to the last point that you just discussed, the issue of um, Europeans or citizens feeling the, um, having the impression of not being heard. And I thought that all of the issues that you raised are very relevant in terms of explaining um, a lot of, uh, explaining better what foreign policy is and trying to work on the maybe sometimes elitist uh, perception of it. Um, but we, I, I felt that there is still the gap of um, them feeling, not feeling being heard is, um, is something different than them not understanding what it is and it, them being explained to what it is. So there is still the, there is a stronger output component maybe that, um, that you've been dis discussing, but the input component might still be lacking. And I wanted to ask you what you think about maybe the citizens council model, um, because in Germany there have been three, I think by now, um, citizens councils. Um, I was um, part of um, consulting one of them, um, actually discussing Germany's role in, in the world, um, so international politics in a very broad uh, context. And it was actually under the chairmanship of uh, Wolfgang Schäuble, the um, Bundestag uh, president. And um, I think they offer a very interesting um, approach because they kind of offer this qualitative model um, of explanation of trying to get a better feeling of what citizens uh, feel and think about foreign policy because with the polls you have um, certain answers to certain questions, but still a lot of room for interpretation. And with those, you have very con you have this qualitative level, and still you have the input focus that you might be able to include in a stronger sense. So, so that would be the question: Do you do you see that those kind of uh, citizens councils could be included in a stronger sense? And um, for example, the as instrument in foreign policy making, either in Germany, EU, uh, EU, or even in the US. So. It is not only about explaining foreign policy to the people. I, ha I will never forget uh, my encounter with uh, a bunch of Austrian citizens where we talked about trust in elites and I said in German, yeah, we need to basically, in German it's, the word is um, abholen, which means basically that's what you do with kids in kindergarten, mm -hmm. like, like you, you do take them home basically. And I, I still remember the citizen standing in front of me because it really made an impression and he had such a point and saying, well, I don't need you to basically pick me up where I am and then kind of to, to help me to see the light. I, I stand very f firm where I stand and th that is my thinking and you should maybe better take note. So is it, is it only a matter of explaining better decisions or should politicians also be, make a more, I don't know, popular foreign policy? It's a really, it, it's a very difficult question because much as um, Manuel said a lot of it's done privately in secret, 
compromises, blah, 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 blah. Um, I think the hard part is more and more, and you feel this certainly in America, but in Europe too, there's a sense that, I mean, what is populism? It's, it's basically the sense that there's a true people somewhere and their interests are being betrayed by an elite which listens to other people, right? So, I mean, as Margaret Thatcher used to say, the problem with the foreign office is it talks to foreigners, right? I mean, <laughs> and, and, you know, that's, been, that's their job. But um, as um, you described, I think bringing people in more and more, listening to them. I mean, we do focus groups, we do all kinds of things, but I think the, one of the biggest problems is to convince an increasingly social media bubbleized uh, world that's more polarized, that feels less together than it's been, um, that leaders are actually listening to them and acting in their best interest. And you, you know, one of the strengths of, of Trump, I have to say, who's an incredibly good politician, you know, what he says sometimes is terrifying, but I mean, he gets to the heart of people's concerns and, and they like it and they feel heard. And um, a lot of it has to do with resentment, a lot of it has to do with the feeling, as he always said, you know, our allies are taking advantage of us and, and so on and so on. But it, it preys on real anxieties. I mean, that's the real danger, I think, and how leaders answer those anxieties in a world where diplomacy is about negotiating, it is about compromising, it is about, in the EU or in NATO, reaching a consensus among a lot of countries with very different views. It's hard to make that a public process. Although, although in Germany, I think many would complain that we don't negotiate enough currently and uh, we just supply uh, too many weapons. And I have a question that links to this question, but um, I think it goes a little further because I think there is this tension between listening to the people, but also maybe politicians being leaders of the people and kind of telling the people where to go because they are convinced that this is the right direction. And in the whole first year of the war, I think we had a vivid discussion in Germany um, when the chancellor always kind of referred to that he needs to keep people on board and that he basically needs to build this huge tent uh, of support for, for his Ukraine um, strategy. And some people were pushing him, um, saying, well, he's not forward-leaning enough. He should basically tell the Germans where to go, and then they would follow. And we've seen examples of this, for example, with the uh, Leopard 2 decision, that initially people were <coughs> against it, but once the decision was taken and it was explained, and, and it kind of Scholz was mm -hmm. firmly behind it, and Pistorius, then uh, support came. So do you think it's more the task of a chancellor or of a leader to lead in foreign policy or to basically listen better? Mm. I think it's, it's both. Um, and I think the leopard example is a very good one because we had this really fierce debate here in Germany. And then when the decision was taken, as you said, the shift, it shifted. But I wonder whether this would have been possible if we had been, say, in Bulgaria, or coming back to your poll, and, and the large range of, of um, the opinions reflected in it. Uh, can you bridge a discrepancy of uh, 50 percentage points? Because with the leopards, there was already it was already closed, and then they took the decision, and it shifted by, I don't and know, all the experts, five or six. Uh, or many yeah, of the experts yes. were in favor, the journalists, yes. everybody was pushing. Yes. The um, public was uh, against. So. Uh, the public was against, but only slightly more against than mm. the group that was for it. And then he, he, he sort of pushed it over the line mm. by taking the decision in Rammstein. And that I, I really just don't know, but I think that's where where that's a point where citizen councils and tours across mm. Germany and going to the media and putting a lot of videos uh, on social media channels explaining it uh, can actually help um, selling your policy to, to the public. Um, and you can certainly shift a, a group of people or convince a group of people. So 
Manuel, so I, the final I word for you, basically. <laughs> okay. Uh, no, I need to find something clever. <laughs> um, no, I, w I, I was saying already, it's not just about communication. And, and uh, you, you need to adjust uh, your policy, which doesn't mean you need to follow um, the public, obviously. And, and the public may change it, its mind uh, anyway. So um, the, the, the that's why the debate is important. And that's why uh, it's not just about uh, journalists talking about uh, foreign uh, I policy or international issues in the media, but it's also about the role that think tanks do play. And Leopard is a very good example <laughs> uh, of uh, starting a debate because you have a sense that it's going to get to the public space anywhere at some point. So you might as well start it earlier and have it in an informed way. Uh, but it's not that far-fetched uh, idea, actually. It's not just that uh, uh, you guys are doing uh, polls uh, or that uh, Alena Baerbock is doing these tours, uh, which, uh, as a policy planner, I'm very interested in how she does it and what it means, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, and we are certainly looking at it from, from France. But uh, there were these uh, EU consultation, uh, citizens' consultations, mm -hmm. which precisely was the idea that you go to the citizens and they have a kind of a, 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 a blank uh, page and there is a discussion organized for ideas to come and for ideas to be presented to the parliament, because obviously it's not an either or, to be presented to the European Council and, and given the what has happened uh, in this consultation process so far, there's probably space for improvement and, and doing uh, more of that. And I'm sure that uh, it would be easier <laughs> to go to the 2024 European Parliament elections being able to say, look, this consultation process that we did, it actually serves a purpose. It was not just to occupy the space and pretend that we are listening, but it, it serves a purpose and we're going to act upon it and there will be more of that uh, uh, later. And uh, it maybe we have a sense that yes, but this is the EU, in a sense the EU is domestic uh, uh, politics uh, uh, more than foreign policy. Uh, well, the UN has had this big consultation process with youth where same, they went across the world, including in uh, countries where the public debate is sometimes a bit complicated, and they tried to understand what the use was uh, looking into because there's this UN summit for the future, which is in preparation, and they wanted to get input uh, uh, from that. And, and there's a lot of different ways you can do it. So I agree with what Stephen was saying, that it's going to be difficult, but if we don't do it, doing foreign policy is going to prove impossible at the end. So I'd rather do the difficult thing that end up with the impossibility of having a foreign policy and including on the points that I made and that you, you uh, underlined, that it's complicated to do uh, diplomacy in a totally uh, transparent uh, uh, manner. There is a difference between foreign policy and diplomacy. And diplomacy is kind of the execution of foreign policy and there's a lot more debate and discussion we can have on foreign policy, even if diplomacy needs to keep some kind of uh, um, Secret, uh, secretness, or, or at least yeah. discretion, discretion. Uh, uh, from time to time. Yeah. The, the foreign but policy I mean is something that we ought to discuss more, surely. But I mean, just, I keep thinking, leaders really need to do more to stand up and explain to their citizens what's at stake for them. <coughs> and it's dangerous. It makes them vulnerable. Mm -hmm. They don't do it very often, I don't think. They don't do it enough. Um, I mean, Schultz has never really given the big speech. He, he did it the other day live when he was arguing, rally. arguing oh. with someone. It was yeah. the best speech I've ever heard him give. You know, <laughs> no, the Zeitlinger speech, I think, was, no, 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 was outstanding. And, and, and anyway, I just think <laughs> leaders also have to be more open about the stakes of foreign policy and what they're doing. I mean, it's. It's easy to say for me, I know, I'm not yeah. a politician, I'm not running for office. But no, but I think that is, that is a very good um, point to conclude on because one other uh, takeaway from our poll is that citizens tend to be 
quite optimistic um, about the future. When we ask about uh, Trump being re-elected, majority thought not very likely. When we asked about a clash, a military clash between the US and China, in our poll, um, majority of people said it's not very likely. So I think it is important, since we have seen in the past that very unlikely things, like the election of Donald Trump in 2016, or um, there is a, a protest, a Ukraine <laughs> protest uh, uh, outside, so uh, talking about the relevance of foreign policy and citizens. I think yeah. this, is, uh, this is a very good um, example. Um, anyhow, so unlikely things do happen. Uh, Trump uh, got elected, Brexit happened. I think in foreign policy, um, that is one of our takeaways. Politicians need to explain much more what's at stake, why it is important, what the risks are, what possible scenarios are, um, and work with the scenarios and explain what the consequences uh, of all of them would be. I think the uh, process with the EU citizens um, was uh, a good idea, but very poorly um, done because I think after all these citizens were heard with all their concerns and their uh, good ideas, nothing uh, followed from it. And it was just basically, yeah, th there was no follow up process. And I think that is even more frustrating for citizens if they have the impression that they have told politicians what they want and then nothing happens. Anyhow, um, we all mentioned how important it is to discuss. Um, it was my pleasure that you followed my invitation and did that with me. Um, I'm very happy that um, some people followed us online and and for those of you who were here, um, thank you for coming. Um, we will do other polls in the future. Other think tanks will do the same. Um, and I think we need to continue this debate and also um, really explain what foreign policy is all about and why it is not an abstract elitist thing, but affects each and everybody on a daily basis. Thank you very much.